was overstated when Eric Drexler wrote uh, Engines of Creation in 1986, I believe it was. He used the concept of self-replicating molecular machinery to illustrate the potential dangers of nanotechnology. It has since turned out that that risk is not as great as uh, was otherwise thought. Uh, you can Google gray goo is a small issue for a white paper on uh, why that is. So most of the risks that uh, productive man technology would create are indirect risks. Uh, they, they would enhance our capability to create computers for AI, mass production of nuclear weapons, and creation of new pathogenic agents. Moving on, uh, like a manufacturing will not be inherently self-replicating, it would be more like assembly lines. So this this assembly line is not going to go wander off into the environment and start self-replicating and devouring the atmosphere. It could just be completely stationary. And I think that uh, the risk comes more from the ability of nanotechnology to create new biological pathogens which are adapted to killing human beings in ways that nanobots are not. Okay, so the first, nuclear waste. Uh, the expert consensus on the impact of nuclear war has gone back and forth over the years. There's been scaremongering uh, by Carl Sagan and others in the 80s. They said nuclear war will kill off everyone, the entire human species. That is not realistic whatsoever. Uh, the worst analysis of nuclear winter does not have a temperature dropping anymore by about 10 degrees in the southern hemisphere. So that's not enough to wipe out uh, any substantial percentage of the human species. But, however, full-fledged nuclear war could kill off as much as 95% of the population in America, Europe, Russia, and China within 12 months. And I'm gonna explain how that is. And this is the disturbing part. So, uh, in the so I, but in the end, I don't think it's a serious expansion risk all on its own. So the one thing that would be devastating from nuclear warfare would be the detonation of a hydrogen bomb far over the surface of the Earth in either the United States or Russia, which would be an EMP and would wipe out the power grid. And that, because everything about our society is based on the power grid, it would collapse all our agriculture, all our critical infrastructure, including the critical infrastructure that pumps water everywhere. There would be no energy, there would be no transportation, because all gasoline distribution would be compromised. There would be no food processing, because all processing from uh, raw grains to the fancy food products we're used to is completely dependent upon electricity and factory systems and all sorts of things like that. So all critical infrastructures would collapse completely from just one hydrogen bomb exploded 300 miles over the surface of the United States. That is really scary. And not enough people are focused on this. Some people in Congress are focused on it, not many. Here's the range of the EMP uh, burst area depending on the altitude of the bomb. So like maybe North Korea or Iran could send a container ship to the Gulf of Mexico right here with a ballistic missile on it, launch it up, detonate it right there, wipe out the power grid would make us completely vulnerable to subsequent attack. So that would be how a nuclear war would begin, with wiping out the power grid. Then it would be followed up by direct um, nuclear bombardment of maybe 500 to 1,000 nuclear missiles. And this is not very threatening the scale of existential risk, actually. <laughs> uh, here's James Woolsey, the former CIA director. Uh, he, given statements about the danger of EMP. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is extremely mainstream. Uh, mainstream intelligence officials, congressmen, uh, statesmen, everyone like that knows about this risk, but it's only begun to be discussed in the last five years or so. Okay, and the headline there is 90% of Americans will be dead. Why would we so many people would be dead because we all depend on advanced technological infrastructure for our food supply and water supply. And that would be wiped out. The reason why it would be wiped out is that the largest transformers, which power our entire power grid, among other components, take more than a year to manufacture. They're only manufactured in small quantities in China and Northern Europe. 
They require one to, a one to two year order time given the normal rate of them running out. So they were all blown apart simultaneously by an electric surge caused by the CNP. They could not be replaced quickly. They could only be replaced within one to two years. So it would take one to two years to bring our technological civilization back to speed under ideal conditions. And most of the security infrastructure, most of civilization, everything would collapse in the meanwhile to make it much harder to replace everything. It would be like Mad Max instantaneously. There would not be enough food. People would start eating each other. This is bad stuff and it would go down. <laughs> So this is the full report on the EMP threat. Uh, I recently read it all the way through. It goes into extreme detail on how EMP would impact each area of critical infrastructure. And they also did tests in an EMP generating machine to figure out which components would be destroyed. And here's what I say to bring it home. You personally could, will die if Iran, North Korea, or some terrorist organization succeeds launching an H bomb from a container ship in the Gulf of Mexico detonates it high in the USA. We are all personally at risk from this. This is the greatest risk to our well-being today, aside for aging. So aging and this, those are the two ones. <laughs> uh, and there's not enough work being done to work to mitigate this, and it could be mitigated quite simply by spending only a few hundred million dollars insulating the critical components of our power grid from uh, electrical surges. And there's been bills uh, floated to address this, but it just hasn't happened. So, all right. Uh, nuclear war, here's some of the temperature drops we get that are full-fledged nuclear war. Ukraine would never go above uh, freezing the entire year. It would be below freezing the entire year. And places like Iowa would barely go above freezing. They'd be like five to 10 degrees in July. Uh, this is for 150 teragram smoke injection from approximately like 2,000 nuclear warheads being detonated. So most of the Northern Hemisphere would be 95% casualty rate because there would be no way to grow crops. The good news is the temperature drops in the southern hemisphere are not that bad. So the southern hemisphere would survive, but the northern hemisphere not so much. Here's a temperature that would, uh, a temperature drop would be caused in Iowa by a full-scale nuclear war. See the red here? This is July. In Iowa, July, five to 10 degrees. That's how warm it would be after a, a big nuclear uh, winter. This is Ukraine. It barely goes above freezing in the red scenario. Okay, nuclear war risk summary. Every year, nuclear weapons are accessible, will continue. Uh, the consequences of even a limited nuclear exchange would be severe, and a full-scale nuclear war would reduce populations in the Northern Hemisphere to 1,700 levels. Okay, this is just a warm-up, nuclear war. It's bigger of a risk than most people think. We should do everything we can to mitigate it. One of the easy ways that we can mitigate it is by figuring out our relationship with Russia, because they're the people with the nukes. And China as well. China and Russia are aligning in a, a alliance against the United States to create this new multipolar world order. America still has this highly interventionist, cowboy-like mentality. Let's go run into Ukraine, let's go run into Syria, let's go run in anywhere we can. Maybe we should reevaluate that, because we're not the top dogs. And the risk of nuclear war is so severe that we should avoid it at all costs. I don't pretend to know exactly how that will work out ge geopolitically, but the, our mentality is still of a pre-nuclear era when it comes to conflict. Okay, via risk. Uh, the main scenario in which a uh, bio risk could be serious is if a universal bioprinter is built probably won't be until the 2030s. It depends on the cost of gene synthesis technology. Uh, so that's a risk that is around the corner, it's not here yet because gene synthesis technology is still very expensive. There's still a lot we can do with gene synthesis technology. Here's the falling cost of what it takes to synthesize uh, new DNA. And you notice like it's kind of leveling off right here. So, it's not improving a la Kurzweil. Kurzweil's scenario is, oh, it's all exponential and we're gonna get 
like unlimited capabilities within finite time, or something like that. But no, it's not really happening. It's kind of, uh, it seems like there needs to be a fundamental new breakthrough in gene synthesis technology to make it happen. So this is not a risk for like the next 20 or so years. We're safe for now. Okay, so how could biotechnology mess with us? Well, Spanish flu plague, they infected about 10 to 30, uh, they infected about 5 to 10 percent of the global population. They killed 2 to 5 percent. Actually, I think it was more like 20 percent they infected. So imagine like 5 or 6 or even 10 or 20 Spanish flus or plagues released simultaneously, all based on this new next generational proteomic technology where you can custom design dangerous viruses and release them. This is more serious to me than the EMP scenario that I discussed before. This is something that we is worth worrying about. And the good news here is that there are permanent fixes. So there will only be a, a particular window in which, in which this will be a danger. But it will be a severe danger for that window. Uh, there are certain pathogens that can persist in the environment for a very long time. Uh, uh, anthrax takes 50 plus years to dissipate and you have to hit it with formaldehyde. And it costs hundreds of millions of dollars even to clean up a very small area. So I don't know whether or not there could be new pathogens that uh, could be created of similar lethality that would be persistent in the environment, but it would be much worse than nuclear fallout. Nuclear fallout goes away within maybe one month or so. This could persist for 50 years if you're unlucky. Here's, this is a fitness landscape in biology. We're probably familiar with this. Um, there's various ways to adapt. So in natural evolution, there needs to be this incremental path because DNA only mutates one base pair at a time. So it needs to slowly navigate through this path going on here. But with advanced biotechnology, you can evaluate a higher fitness peak that a virus could have when it comes to killing or also for positive applications as well, negative, and teleport the thing from here to here by simultaneously changing many of its genes, changing a lot of its molecular code, or it's creating a new molecular code from scratch, a new DNA from scratch. So it's scary that that new possibility will threaten us as well as benefit us. It opens up a lot of possibilities both ways. Uh, there was a new milestone recently, a uh, artificial genetic code was created for the first time and uh, two artificial nucleotides were introduced into bacterial DNA. Um, and the thing about this that's a little freaky is that we're surrounded by bacteria at all times, of course, and the bacterial population is kept in check by these little things called phages. And they're the most numerous um, living-ish thing on the planet, these phages. There's a, an almost uncountable number. They're constantly keeping the bacterial population in check. So imagine if there were bacteria that were immune to phages. That could be a crisis because there would be nothing in the environment to keep them in check naturally. This is something that is not sufficiently explored. It's a big like, huh, what do we do about that thing that requires the attention of uh, experts? I'm not a biology expert. So someone should look into this. I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> There's viruses that we all have that 65 to 90 percent of 10 year olds are infected by a virus called BK virus. And it has no symptoms. So it's good that it has no symptoms, but there are many viruses that we all have that are universal or nearly universal in the human species. And that's another freaky thing because it shows that that's a possibility that a virus can be spread throughout the entire human species, or nearly so. And what if you could create a virus that spread throughout the entire species and had a kill switch that could be turned on somehow and could wipe out like 90% of the human species maybe in a couple months? Ugh, not so good. But the good news, Stanford scientists are working on broad spectrum antiviral drugs. So the traditional way is just one drug, one virus, one drug, and, but the new way is going to be drugs that wipe out many viruses simultaneously. So that's a plus. What else is a plus? 
These things, Robert Freitas designed them in 2001. If we can build nanobots that act as an artificial immune system, that could actually completely solve the problem. No more bio risk. Hey, if we all have these in our bloodstream, we'll be great. So this is why bio risk, I only give it about 8% of the total probability mass because eventually, in my estimation, in the 2060s, we will develop the solution to cure all diseases. But in the meantime, there's a bit of risk there. So that's my summary, blah, 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 I just said that. Uh, okay, next, the third risk, AI risk, the greatest risk. I assign a probability mass of 90%. I'm going to be brief with this one because many other people have already discussed it, and my original research that I did was primarily on those two other issues. The Machine Intelligence Research Institute has identified the biggest challenges. They're working on them. They're decently well-funded. They could use more funding. Alongside SENS, I think that they're the most worthy uh, contribution of donor dollars if you're trying to maximize your expected lifespan and the expected lifespan of the human species. Uh, in my opinion, the AI risk is low prior to 2050, but increases sharply after that point. Arguments against the long-term feasibility of AI are very unconvincing. There are no academic references I can find that argue that AGI, artificial general intelligence, is impossible in principle. None. If you can find one, tell me. Because I can only find people who casually think it's impossible. Like people on Reddit or something. That's not the same as an academic reference. So, you know, like teenagers like to say, you know, you can never create AI because that would make human beings not be special. That's what Tosh Dogger also says. But, you know, like it would offend me if AGI could be created, basically, is the argument. So here's the risk, something like this where artificial intelligence and self-replicating machinery are integrated into a system that is completely not dependent upon human beings. This has been done to death in science fiction, you know what I'm talking about. And just as an example, this is a new press release item from this week. A new computer program can use image databases of millions of images to classify concepts based on these combinatorial combinations. So AGI, AI, not around the corner, but eventually people are working on this kind of thing. There's always new interesting breakthroughs going on. It's slow progress, it's not quick. The Turing test thing that you might have heard about recently, nah, nah, nah. Nothing past the Turing test. It was not a comprehensive enough test. I'm not gonna go into that in depth. That's a whole argument. But here's the basic facts. Computers are improving. This is a graph from Moravec. Eventually, they're going to reach human brain computing processing power. By some estimates, some of the most powerful ones already have. And eventually, you'll be able to buy human equivalent computing processing power for 100 bucks or something. And the issue will just be software, not hardware. This is what's going to happen inevitably, eventually. As I've said, maybe 2060 to 2100. Could be sooner, could be later. Who to read? Nick Bostrom, Ray Kurzweil, Hans Moravec. On AI safety, Eliezer Yudkowsky, Stephen Alejandro. You'd find Miri publications there. How to deal with this? Create AI that has a positive rather than negative effect on humanity and is dominant. Uh, there's various arguments to the effect that AI would be innately selfish, essentially, which is why I give it a high probability of being a threat to humanity. Uh, it's a whole another argument, I'm not going to go into it here. Most common objections to the feasibility of artificial intelligence involve basic misunderstandings of how AI in general works. They've been argued many times in many mailing lists, I'm not going to go into them now, and that's it. to acquire more resources. So... But humans are a resource. Humans are matter. So we can be used, or the matter that we happen to be made of can be used to pursue other goals. Or even like to say that there is, yes? So like how about all the animals and plants too? 
whatever. I mean, perhaps convert the entire surface of the planet or the entire planet itself into computers or just keep it locked down. Like, but it would be boring if it's an AI. It probably wants more variety than that. But computers are very good with not becoming bored. Yes. <laughs> this is a huge debate topic. Yeah, over there. Uh, so, what are the questions? Is, uh, So during the Toba bottleneck, you might have heard of, it was about that many. But that's a biological thing, not really a human thing, right? Like, um, we have a mind machinery to extract oil at that point, you know? Uh, we can make it happen. <laughs> I think the other has to be small. Yeah. Because uh, at, the, at, at the fantastic rate that the technology and the uh, uh, complexity is growing, Yep, out of this entire talk, that's the one thing that I was least sure about.
talking about the entire human species. But if it had its own independent goal systems, they could be extremely alien to us and be inconsistent with our continued existence. So that's why I'm more afraid about AGI, but I agree that that's also a risk as well. Yeah. For example, Stuxnet was designed to or intended to be confined to that nuclear plant, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. Yes. Your question? Uh, yeah. So, um, okay. well, first to risks that you mentioned in biology and nuclear. Um, in both cases, it seems to me like most of the exploration, the picture that you presented here, was on one side of the equation and then this is what could happen. Not in terms of Here's the uh, continuity for technology that we could bring to bear in recovery or preventing. I know you did some preventing. But uh, just from, uh, from a, a distant perspective, it seems to me to be a strange function that it would take two years for the electric secret to recover. Um, given the amount of knowledge we have about how electricity works and the amount of ingenious people there are in this. Uh, read the EMP. John Smart thinks that we might go into inner space instead of outer space and upload ourselves and never leave the planet, so that would be great too. <laughs> okay, that's it.